if they're measurable for um, so continue I think so can first and foremost everyone see the films got it so yeah this is me I'm at Gloucestershire um, NHS uh, Foundation Trust consultant radiologist. My interest is interventional radiology, but I will spare you uh, any interventional radiology for this evening. Um, I'd like to start off just thinking about how you look at a radiological image. So first and foremost, make sure you're looking at the, the right image. Um, make sure that you're looking at um, what you think you're supposed to be looking at for the right patient at the right time. Um, check side markers. They're usually on a film and they should be on a film, either CT or plain film and make sure they're correct. Uh, and then think about any previous imaging. If you're provided with previous imaging, for goodness sake, um, do take that. Um, in terms of the investigation, interpreting any sort of um, investigation, think about what it is that you're looking at. Why is it being done? What's the clinical scenario? This will guide you as to what to expect from the, um, from the film itself. And whatever you're doing, try and sound like you know what you're doing, even if you're absolutely flummoxed. So think about your systematic approach and start with the simple things first. This is a chest X-ray of such and such a patient. It is a PA presentation or whatever. And then take it from there. Even if you've got absolutely no idea what it is that you're looking at, don't panic. Take your time. Think about it and just be methodical. Thinking about chest X-rays specifically. Um, PA versus AP projections. If it is a PA projection, that won't be written on the film. If it's an AP projection, that should be clearly marked on the film. It's posterior anterior versus andro posterior. This relates to how the X rays enter the patient. So, for a PA departmental conventional film, the film is at the um, front of the patient immediately against the anterior mediastinum. And the x-rays enter the patient posteriorly so they come in from the back so you don't get any magnification on the film whereas with an AP projection the film's at the back of the patient these are the ones that you see being done in patients who are slumped on um, on a bed in the intensive care department the film's at the back of the patient the beam enters the patient from the front you therefore get a divergent beam which creates artificial magnification of the heart and the anterior mediastinal structures so you can't accurately interpret heart size on an AP projection. Similarly, think about the other technical factors. If you're concerned about rotation of a film, look for the medial lens of the clavicle, look for the trachea centrally. Does it look central? Does it look rotated? Are things looking symmetrical? And think about whether it's reasonably penetrated. You should be able on a normal, on good quality film to be able to see the vertebral bodies through the mediastinum. And think about the degree of inspiration. You should have a good full inspiration. You will never see a full inspiration on an intensive care patient. That's pretty much unheard of. So think about those technical factors and how they um, affect the image. As I say, have your system. And if you're stumped, sometimes it just helps just to kind of sit back from the film and take a look at the overall film. Think about the extras on the film, tubes, lines, drains, anything, and just see if there's anything that you, you know, then just jumps out at you. I have a system when looking at, at chest films. Primarily, I look at the heart first, look at heart size. Then I look at the lungs around it. Then I look at the periphery. But when I'm looking at review areas, I have to specifically think trachea, apices through the heart and mediastinum. What am I not seeing behind the heart and then below the hemidiaphragms? So try and remember those review areas. In terms of a CT brain, I think in an exam, the most likely thing you'll get is a non-contrast brain. The vast majority of um, CT brain that we do is done to assess for you know, intracerebral bleed, intracerebral lesions. Blood will be white on a non-contrast CT brain. That's because of the narrow CT windowing. So soft tissues, because brain obviously is all similar sort of density tissue, we need to window it very narrowly, which means that blood appears hyperdense, even in the absence of contrast. So if you see white, think bleed and think about where it is. So is it intracranial, uh, sorry, intracerebral? Is it subdural? Is it extradural, subarachnoid, et cetera? You might see both of those on a, on a film, particularly trauma films, you can have extradural and subarachnoid blood. Think about whether there's blood in the ventricles. You may see it layered, particularly within the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles. 
be aware of how the blood density changes. It does evolve over time. So it goes from hyperdense initially in an acute setting through the similar sort of density to the brain parenchyma and then becomes lower attenuation relative to the brain parenchyma, depending on how old it is. It's reasonable in a large size subdural hemorrhage, for example, to see acute blood or hyperdense blood remaining even after a week or so, but much beyond sort of a week to two weeks, and you're expecting that to be hypoattenuating, and even similar to CSF attenuation on very you know old hemorrhage. If you don't see blood, think what else there might be um, that, that you would identify on the on the film, and think about stroke particularly. Think about space occupying lesion. Listen to the history, and then don't forget the bones. So far as MRI is concerned, I think it would be very unfair of them to give you anything too technical on a, an anaesthetic exam. Um, differentiating between T1 and T2 weighted images, most um, easily and straightforwardly look at fluid. On T2 weighted images, fluid is a high signal, um, whereas on T1 weighted images, fluid is low signal. So if you've got anything with CSF in it, then look at the CSF, see what signal that is. That should tell you whether or not it's T1 or T2. We've all seen the pictures. We all know exactly what happens when you put something in the, um, the MRI scanner that shouldn't be in the MRI scanner. Um, so anything ferromagnetic really shouldn't be putting it in there. If you're concerned about that, you could x-ray the patient to assess it. The majority of implants, for example, are now MRI compatible. This includes pacemakers, et cetera but it's always best to check the model number and check with the manufacturer first. Even though we regard MRI as safe in pregnancy or comparatively so, we still wouldn't recommend using it in the first trimester uh, because of the tissue heating effects that might occur with MR. So ideally try and avoid it then. Likewise, think about post-surgical patients, ideally try and avoid that in the first six weeks post-operatively. Different units have different rules. As far as a helium quench, um, that's a fairly disastrous event. Um, it happens, your magnetic field's immediately switched off by a helium quench, so you don't need to worry about that. But what you do need to worry about is getting your patient out of the MRI scanner as fast as possible and assessing them for the side effects of um, a helium asphyxiation and the high pressures that occur when you get immediate quenching and transformation of liquid into gaseous helium. In terms of your EMA legislation, um, it's nice to know that the FRCA syllabus is already out of date. The EMA regulations it quotes uh, were EMA 2000, those changed in 2017. So EMA um, 2017, ionizing radiation medical exposures reg uh, regulations, they govern patient exposure to medical ionizing radiation. All you need to know is that you need to justify uh, to provide enough information to allow the radiologist to justify exposing a patient to ionizing radiation and also be aware of the risks of ionizing uh, radiation to patients, be those stochastic, which are the sort of chance genetic mutations, etc., that lead to malignancy, versus deterministic, which are the sort of burns, etc., that can occur following prolonged uh, exposures, for example, with. Uh, cardiac angiography for, uh, where you'll see skin changes associated. So now to the important thing. So cases, I make no apologies for trying to squeeze as many as possible in so that you get a, a flavor and just see as much as you possibly can. Uh, so bear with me, um, but I'll try and show you all the salient points. This is one of my favorite chest x-rays. Uh, this is a 58 year old man who kept presented to the emergency department, pretty much an extremist. History was of um, severe chest pain, which happened about three weeks prior to this. And um, he was too busy to come to the emergency department at that point. So pitched up extremely short of breath and effectively drowning um, when he arrived in the emergency department with absolutely fulminant cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You will not see a better example of um, bat wing shadowing pleural effusion, markedly enlarged heart. This is a PA projection, so you know this is a very big heart. And then you've got linear interstitial lines there. Those are curly B lines, thin interstitial septal lines, which are perpendicular to the pleural surface. And this is absolutely classic acute pulmonary edema. This man had a, a flail posterior mitral valve leaflet, secondary to papillary rupture uh, due to a late presentation MI.
Next patient, young patient, um, ostensibly nothing particularly wrong with this chest X-ray, but the salient point is this right-sided pick line. If you see a pick line, think chemotherapy and start to think what is the underlying malignancy. In this case, the patient had hematological malignancy, came in just feeling a little bit short of breath, having had a recent transfusion. He had blunting of the costophrenic angle, little bit of airspace pacification, but otherwise really nothing terribly wrong. Wasn't neutropenic, didn't appear septic, but within 24 hours, the chest X-ray looked like this. And he was significantly more breathless, significantly more unwell. And you can see these areas of lobulated pacification. Those are absolutely classic lobular sort of secondary lobules within the lungs. That's alveolar edema. You've got relative sparing of the subpleural surfaces. And then within another 24 hours, things look like this. So you've got much more confluent edema throughout both lungs. This could quite easily pass for ARDS, but in actual fact, this was a hypersensitivity reaction and um, sort of transfusion hypersensitivity reaction. Similarly, in a patient having chemotherapy, think about drug sensitivity and drug hypersensitivity reactions as well. They're entirely possible, particularly with some of the um, sort of immunotherapies and some of the particularly breast cancer uh, chemotherapies that are out there. So next patient, oh, sorry. And this was his chest X-ray, literally another 24 hours after that. So it cleared as quickly as it came on. So this, the rapidity with which the changes occurred and the rapidity with which the changes resolved fits very much with edema rather than anything else. So, um, so that was very much a, a sort of hypersensitivity, acute pulmonary edema, which resolved following the appropriate treatment. This patient, not so lucky. So this patient was a middle-aged woman with an, a background of immunodeficiency syndrome. Um, she presented with thigh pain and swelling, myositis, uh, which rapidly progressed to a, an abscess within her thigh and systemic sepsis. Um, necrotizing fasciitis was postulated, but it actually didn't turn out to be that. But her chest X-ray very rapidly um, became severely abnormal. As you can see, supine, mobile, AP, DCC film. So this is Department of Critical Care. And um, you've got central line appropriately positioned, right main bronchus, superior vena cava, tip of that line is right at the cavo atrial junction, perfectly positioned, no evidence of a pneumothorax, but she has extensive airspace pacification, some perihyla predominance, and this is ARDS. So the two, you know, just edema per se, ARDS, difficult to differentiate the two, but think about the clinical scenario and think about what's most likely in the context of someone presenting with sepsis multi-organ failure versus someone presenting previously extremely well and, um, and just hedge your bets, really. This was another very young patient presented with a short history of worsening shortness of breath and very rapidly progressed again to sort of fulminant pulmonary diffuse alveolar ground glass opacification again the differential is either ARDS or, um, or severe pulmonary edema obviously you can see here air bronchograms beautifully delineated throughout both lungs now that would go against it being sepsis because essentially if you were you know, if you had bilateral pulmonary consolidation to this degree you'd be utterly moribund this is fluid and uh, in fact, this was a sort of ARDS edema type picture, secondary to what ultimately turned out to be an underlying hematological malignancy, but which was undiagnosed prior to presentation. ET tube, perfectly positioned, internal jugular line, perfectly positioned, NG tube, straight down the middle, bisecting carina, bisecting hem at the diaphragm through the gastroesophageal junction and into stomach. So all lines present and correct. This patient is an example of an expiratory film or sort of diaphragmatic splinting, which means that they haven't been able to take a full inspiration. And these are the changes that you see when you can't get someone to take a full inspiration. You've got one, two, three anterior rib ends above the hemidiaphragms, but you can see the hemidiaphragms very clearly. 
So there's very little in the way either of pleural effusion or of consolidation or atelectasis at those lung bases, a little bit of a pacification down the left base. But this essentially is a fully expiratory film due to diaphragmatic splinting. This patient actually, if you can see here down at the bottom, you've got um, clips within the region of the lesser curvature of the stomach. This patient had significant gastric varices, had presented with a gastric bleed, uh, and in fact had decompensated liver failure and ascites, which led to the diaphragmatic splinting, which resulted in this appearance. The reason the internal jugular line looks quite as far into the heart is, as that is because obviously the mediastinum can't drop down because of the degree of diaphragmatic splinting. This patient, um, as you can see by chest wall deformity and the sort of very abnormal configuration of the skeleton, previous surgical spinal fixation, um, had severe cerebral palsy, severe learning difficulties. She actually presented for a dental extraction, um, but post-operatively became unwell. AP semi-erect recess film, you can see there is complete opacification throughout the, um, the left hemithorax, poor aeration of the right side, and she'd actually mucus plugged on the left. However, the more salient abnormality is subdiaphragmatic. She had a huge pneumoperitoneum. This is the liver outline. This is the diaphragm. You see how pencil thin that is when you see it with air adjacent on both sides. This is the falciform ligament running down the anterior aspect of the liver. Again, air both sides. This is a huge pneumoperitoneum secondary to what turned out to be a perforated sigmoid volvulus. So remember, look under the diaphragm. In this case, um, Again, chest x-ray, you look at it and think, mm, that doesn't look too bad. This is a 29-year-old uh, man who presented um, with sudden onset chest pain whilst playing football. Um, and if you're looking at his heart size, borderline cardiac uh, enlargement, and just a very slightly prominent pulmonary knuckle, um, he... You know, below the diaphragms, nothing too dramatic. Lungs otherwise completely clear. Um, his D-dimer, obviously somebody pre presenting with chest pain can't enter the hospital without having a D-dimer done, was elevated. Bear in mind, D-dimer is an extremely non-specific test. Um, and in fact, his troponin was also elevated. Uh, but in reality, even though on this X-ray, the aortic knuckle here, and think about it, you've got your aortic knuckle, descending thoracic aorta, ascending thoracic aorta, doesn't look abnormal. He subsequently went on to have a CT pulmonary angiogram, that's dense contrast within the pulmonary trunk, but the abnormality on that CT was actually the degree of dilatation of his ascending aorta, um, and he then subsequently had CT aortic angiogram, third time lucky for tests, and that showed his aortic dissection. And in fact, he had underlying Marfans and had presented with a spontaneous aortic dissection. He underwent median stenotomy. That's an aortic valve, metallic aortic valve replacement. And you can see in the background there, although he underwent valve replacement and interposition graft to the ascending aortic component, the distal aortic component, distal arch, and down into the descending thoracic aorta has got an endovascular stent graft within it, which sealed the distal dissection. This patient, I think we're now gonna just con concentrate on NG tubes and how you know whether or not they're in the right place, because I think that is important. Um, if you look at this patient, she has got, oops, sorry, apologies, NG tube running down, bisects the carina through the midline between the hemidiaphragms, but the tips in the region of the gastroesophageal junction that needs to be advanced further to ensure that it's fully intragastric. In this case, however, don't be misled. Yes, it's central. Yes, it appears to bisect the carina. You can see the trachea here and the right main bronchus, left main bronchus does appear to be midline, but at that point, rather than continuing down between the two hemidiaphragms, it deviates to the right. And the tip 
is very far lateral for anything that's intragastric or intraintestinal. Internal jugular line, satisfactory position. Uh, subsequent chest X-ray following commencement of feeding revealed the uh, slightly catastrophic mistake. This NG tube is in the pleural space. This fluid is intrapleural and you have a large pleural effusion, which was confirmed on the subsequent CT scan. So you can see the NG tube. If we just go back there slightly, the NG tube runs posterior. You've got trachea, gas-filled esophagus, NG tube posterior to the gas-filled esophagus, fluid throughout the right hemithorax. And this patient had a pharyngeal pouch through which her NG tube passed before going into her pleural cavity. And that is a never event that we would all prefer to avoid. So she has a large loculated right pleural effusion as a consequence of malpositioning of that NG tube. Next patient, right mid zone opacification. In fact, you can see the horizontal fissure clearly delineated. So think about, you're looking at the chest X-ray, it's a two dimensional structure of a three dimensional entity. So think about your lungs, think about your lobes, think about what is next to which. So you've got your upper lobe and your middle lobe anteriorly, these are but the horizontal fissure, obviously your oblique fissure is bordered by both lower lobe and upper lobe and to a lesser degree, the middle lobe. Your right heart border is bordered by aerated right middle lobe or just middle lobe, no left middle lobe, obviously. And the horizontal fissure there is delineated due to air within the middle lobe, consolidation in the upper lobe, basal segments, and there is a possible opacity projected through there, which looks as though there's blunt ending of the right main bronchus, and there's a malignancy of that hilum. Yes, there does appear to be prominence of the aorta, but bear in mind this is an AP semi-erect portable film, so that could well be spuriously magnified. In this case, I think it's a fair game to talk about zones if you're not absolutely confident which lobe it is that's consolidated. So talk about upper zone, mid zone, and lower zone. Uh, but in this context, you can see the right heart border very clearly. So that suggests that the middle lobe remains well aerated. You've lost the hemidiaphragm. You can't see the hemidiaphragm clearly. It's the lower lobe that predominantly abuts the hemidiaphragm. So in this context, this lower zone opacification is consistent with lower lobe consolidation. There's also a bit of consolidation or opacification here on the left side. So it's reasonable to postulate that this is infective consolidation. You've got bilateral and that slightly mottled appearance. Think about your atypical pneumonias, but essentially this is low bar, right lower lobe pneumonia. This is a similar presentation, shortness of breath, sepsis, etc. But on this occasion, you've got a very clear meniscus, which suggests that there is fluid. You've got very dense opacification throughout the lower zone. You've completely lost the right heart border and you've completely lost that hemidiaphragm. The degree of density here really implies fluid as well as potentially consolidation, because bear in mind, medial ends of the clavicle, central trachea, you've not lost volumes. That doesn't really suggest much in the way of collapse. And you can get hyperexpansion if you do have collapse. So sometimes you don't see volume loss, particularly with a, you know, sort of, for example, middle lobe collapse with a background of low bar consolidation of the right lower lobe. So when we did a CT scan of this patient, that illustrates it quite nicely that you have pleural fluid, that's pleural effusion. And then as we move down through, you can see 
the blood vessels running through this consolidated right lower lobe. There's fluid within the right main bronchus, there's a little air pocket there, aerated left main bronchus. Again, you can see fluid within the right main bronchus, consolidation of the right lower lobe. But this slightly denser entity here is a collapsed middle lobe with aerated upper lobe anterior to it. And then if we look at the lateral projection, the lateral sagittal view, you can see again, this is horizontal fissure. Subpleural fluid collection. Consolidated lower lobe and aerated upper lobe. So middle lobe collapse, lower lobe consolidation, upper lobe aeration. And that helps you think about the anatomy of the lung. Uh, this patient, again, thinking about the anatomy of the lung, you've got your very clearly demarcated border of the thoracic aorta, descending thoracic aorta. You can see your aortic knuckle, descending thoracic aorta. And there's a sort of double heart border. This is a mass, soft tissue mass. Because you can see the aorta, you know the aorta is posterior, so it can't be a posterior mass. You can see the bronchus, left main bronchus, and the pulmonary artery, neither of which period is particularly distorted, so it's probably not mid-mediastinal. You can't fully see, you can see clear heart border here, but you can't fully see the heart border here. So that suggests that this is an anterior mediastinal mass. Lung is otherwise completely clear, but hyperexpanded. So this patient has some emphysema, paucity of peripheral lung markings, hyperinflation. But in fact, this turned out to be an incidental pericardial cyst. Um, anterior, and this confirmed the location within the anterior mediastinum. Mobile AP erect film, this patient presented acutely short of breath, history of vomiting, and this mid and lower zone of pacification. You can see that hemidiaphragm reasonably clearly. You can't particularly see the heart border. So that suggests lingular anterior consolidation, but there is also probably some upper lobe and lower lobe potentially um, aspiration pneumonitis. And this was an aspiration pneumonia. Note below the diaphragm, dilated loops of small bell, which are better appreciated when you re-window. You can see the valvuli conventes coming all the way across the bowel. So that dis distinguishes small bell from large bowel, valvuli versus house tree. And this patient had an obstructing splenic flexure carcinoma with decompression of the obstructed large bowel into the small bowel and gross small bowel dilatation evident on their CT scan. So this chest X-ray, again, although it doesn't say AP projection, you've got increased size of the aortic knuckle. So you're assuming this is a PA film, this therefore could well be an enlarged aorta, but actually, the findings that I wanted to demonstrate on this film is the saccular bronchiectasis with air fluid levels within those peripherally dilated bronchi. Uh, and this is a very fine example of bronchiectasis. The left lung looks much more normal. Uh, so this is probably a unilateral bronchiectasis, likely therefore secondary to infection. So post-infective bronchiectasis rather than something like cystic fibrosis, which obviously would give you bilateral pulmonary changes. But this is the appearance to, do, to look for and to think about, you know, consider those differentials if you see evidence of bronchiectasis and fluid pooling within those bronchiectatic um, segments. Again, lines, if you've got a defibrillator or an ICD that is definitely within the superior vena cava than if you see your tip of your internal jugular line lying outside that superior vena cava in conjunction with an apical opacity. Um, you should very definitely think about um, whether that line is in the incorrect position. And then 
This is a CT pulmonary angiogram. I thought I'd throw in a CT pulmonary angiogram as well. You may get one, maybe not. Pulmonary trunk, right main pulmonary artery, left main pulmonary artery, large pulmonary arterial filling defects bilaterally with evidence of gross right heart strain. So you've got very marked dilatation of your right atrium and your left uh, and your right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. You've got flattening of the interventricular septum, shift of the apex. So these are classical signs of severely elevated right heart pressures, right heart, you know, apical shift, the whole lot. And this is um, submassive pulmonary embolus. So if we pause and then just move on to um, brains, as I say, something else to think about. This is a non-contrast CT brain. Caveat to what I said about white. If you see calcification with, sorry, if you see white within the ventricles and it's not layered dependently, that is probably calcification within the choroid plexus. If it's midline, then that could be pineal calcification. So don't be foxed by those. Um, but in this context, obviously, the salient abnormality is extensive low attenuation throughout the right cerebral hemisphere with some slightly higher attenuation, but more iso intense to, um, to brain substance. You've got mass effect, compression of that lateral ventricle and effacement of the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle on the right compared to the lateral the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle on the left. Midline shift, there's your falx anteriorly. So you've got definite subfalcine herniation. Cell sci on the left are all visible, cell sci on the right are all effaced. So these are all salient signs of significant mass effect, edema, swelling, all secondary to a large acute MCA territory infarct, which was clearly demonstrated just slightly lower down. You've got density, high density within this branching structure, which is the MCA just as it enters the sylvian fissure, low attenuation surrounding in keeping with that acute infarct. So that's acute MCA territory infarct, secondary to MCA thromboembolic event. In this context though, very less defined a pacification and more diffuse pacification, not definitely intravascular and actually going around the basal systems and along the subarachnoid surfaces. So this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, acute subarachnoid blood, uh, secondary to a large hyperdense spherical structure, obstructing third ventricle, Again, blood tracking along the sylvian fissure, following the pattern of the sulci. So that's consistent with subarachnoid, acute subarachnoid blood bilaterally arising from a large basilar tip aneurysm, which subsequently underwent coiling. In this context, you've got acute crescentic blood. So this is subdural hemorrhage, slightly mixed attenuation. So there could be a sort of acute on chronic element. You can see again, your sulci visible on the left, effaced on the right, mild associated midline shift, significant associated mass effect. This blood's extending right the way over the cerebral surface. That's quite a significant intracerebral, uh, sorry, subdural hemorrhage. Don't be fooled. Sometimes subdural hemorrhages, contrary to the kind of edict that extradural hemorrhages are, you know, convex and subdurals are concave. The reality is that the way to differentiate between subdural hemorrhage and extradural hemorrhage is to think that extradural hemorrhages will be constrained by the dura. So where your dura is fixed, i.e. around the sutures. OK where the dura is fixed, an extra jaw couldn't extend beyond that. So this is in fact a subdural hemorrhage and you uh, anteriorly, you've got low density, chronic subdural hemorrhage in combination with more extensive acute 
subdural hemorrhage, which is then extending over the posterior aspect of that cerebral hemisphere just below the bone. Rewindow if you can, just to see that more clearly. You've also on this side got more diffuse acute blood, but this is within the subarachnoid space. And this is why I say you may see a combination of factors. This was an elderly patient who had a fall. Again, the age of the patient is a good indicator. If it's an elderly patient, they've got a you know, relatively atrophic brain. The brain can rattle around, you get the shear forces and the shearing of the vessels over the surface of the brain, which cause the subdural hemorrhage rather than extra dural hemorrhage, which typically is post-traumatic. And you would see if you re-windowed onto bone windows, you'd see the fracture potentially associated with the extra dural. So remember to look, to, you know, look for that if you, um, if you get the opportunity. But very large acute on chronic subdural hemorrhage with associated midline shift, mass effect, sulcal effacement, effacement of the anterior horns of the lateral ventricles and indeed anterior horn of this, the contralateral ventricle and associated subarachnoid blood. This is an extradural hemorrhage. So you can see it's constrained by the sulci. So this is the, if you think about your um, anterior frontal sutures, Sub, uh, extradural, the dura constrains the acute blood or subacute blood because this isn't quite as dense as you might get with the immediate acute hemorrhage. But again, it's unusual to see an extradural hemorrhage not presenting acutely, so that might be a bit artifactual. You've got significant associated edema, midline shift, effacement of that lateral ventricle, effacement of the structures around there, some narrowing of the posterior systems. So you worry about mass effect and potential tonsillar descent, potential you know, significantly elevated intracranial pressures. In this um, left hemisphere, intracerebral blood. So this is sort of demarcated by the brain parenchyma. You've got low attenuation surrounding acute intracerebral hemorrhage, again, acute intracerebral hemorrhage, slightly evolving because you've got slightly different attenuations, surrounding edema, significant associated midline shift and mass effect. This is an example of borderline tonsillar descent. You're allowed up to five millimeters descent of the tonsils below the frame and magnum. There can be asymmetry of those tonsils, but you can see here how there is some crowding of that frame and magnum with the tonsils descending around the brainstem, acute MCA territory infarct with sulcal effacement relative to the contralateral side. Example of an intraventricular drain. This is a posterior, so left, uh, sorry, right parietal intraventricular drain, which was connected actually to a shunt but with quite significant hydrocephalus suggesting shunt blockage. This is a very good example of um, diffuse hypoxic brain injury. So it's the image on the left here. You've got a patient who presents post self-asphyxiation, um, hypoxic out of hospital arrest. You can see that there is some preservation of the gray white matter differentiation, but you're starting to lose the anatomical marks and the degree of differentiation isn't as crisp as we've seen on the preceding images. This is the same patient 48 hours later when you have what's known as the reversal sign. So whereas previously your deep white matter is low attenuation, on this the internal capsule there, deep white matter is actually denser than the gray matter. And that reversal sign is indicative of severe diffuse hypoxic brain injury. You've got severe edema and changes, particularly in the oxygen dependent gray matter areas of the brain. And to finish up, this is an interesting case that we had recently, a uh, young man, history of right-sided cholesteatoma and ear infection who presented acutely febrile with a right-sided facial swelling. And as we run through the images there, you can see he has a fluid collection related to the site of previous surgery. So if we go back through those images, 
go up to that defect, you can see mastoid present on the left, absent on the right, with the peripherally enhancing fluid collection arising from that left, sorry, right ear. And you also, if you can see, there's high attenuation, and this is a post-contrast image. So you've got dense contrast in the basilar artery, you've got dense contrast in the blood vessels, this is the sigmoid sinus on the left and it's low attenuation on the right. And as you go through that, you can see that your transverse sinus on the left, there is a pacified with contrast, whereas on the right, it's unapacified. And there is actually extensive thrombus extending around those, which is denoted by absence of contrast enhancement. And that's extending around the transverse sinus, down the sigmoid sinus, and into the foramen lacerum, through which your internal jugular vein passes. A pacified internal jugular vein on the left, unapacified internal jugular vein on the right, and this is an example of Lemierre's syndrome, which is thrombotic occlusion of the internal jugular, secondary typically to pharyngeal um, sepsis, but actually can be related to any form of craniopharyngeal sepsis. And in this context is related to cholesteatoma. So you can see peripheral contrast around a central filling defect within the internal jugular vein on that right side, indicative of thrombus. And then lower down, there is actually full contrast to pacification of that internal jugular vein, symmetrical both sides, um, which gives you clear indication that the filling defect is true and um, consistent with that Lemierre's. So, Witterfa, uh, we all have these moments. Um, don't panic. Think carefully about what the type of study is. Think about the history you have been given. Everything in radiology, contrary to popular belief, is in the history. So that's why it's really important that when you're approaching a radiologist, you give them the correct clinical scenario. Um, think of this in the exam. Take your time. Think logically. Look at the study. Think about what you're looking at tie it in with the clinical scenario and by doing so think about what it is that you're actually looking for what you're likely to find and then see if you can correlate that with what you're looking at in front of you um, it's perfectly reasonable if you're sitting in horrible silence and can't think of anything and can't see anything to say you don't know what it is because then you can move on but really give it an educated guess first and um, yeah the clue will be in the history and best of luck with everything all right Thanks very much. Oh, Thanks, and one, I was just going to say one last thing. Radiopedia, if you've got any images that you want to just look up and see what they are, I would recommend that as a website. It's really useful.